welcome to Hollywood. The Armed Forces Radio and Television Service brings you the Hollywood Radio Theater, starring... John Lund in The Iron Mistress. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Irving Cummings. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Tonight's play, The Iron Mistress, tells not only of the exciting adventures in the life of James Bowie, one of our most famous frontiersmen, but also of his romantic attachment for a beautiful but unscrupulous woman. And as our stars of this action-packed Warner Brothers picture, we have Virginia Mayo in her original role, and John Lund. Now, act one of The Iron Mistress, starring Virginia Mayo as Julia Lund and John Lund as Jim Bowie. The year 1825. The place, the French Quarter of New Orleans. A famous de Carre, and a street filled with a jostling humanity. It was the confusion of these strange sights and sounds that caused young Jim Bowie to walk squarely into Monsieur Audubon. Yes, and with such force as to knock Monsieur Audubon's armload of paintings to the cobblestone. Oh, oh Monsieur! Oh, oh. I beg your pardon, sir. Oh, but can we not see where the walls? My beautiful paintings, please, they please. are all over. Let me pick them up for you. Oh, I can. Well, now, an eagle, a kingfisher, a heron. Don't you paint anything but birds? Now, that is the question everyone asks, especially my landlady. Oh, monsieur, that woman has no soul, only a hand outstretched for the rent. Well, here's something different. Monsieur? So you do paint something besides birds. Who is she? Oh, <laughs> that one. She is one of my unfinished portraits. Ah, uh -huh. and her name? Mademoiselle de Bonnet. It is thanks to her I have no roof over my head. Oh, she's your landlady. Oh, very beautiful. My landlady, Mademoiselle de Bonnet? <laughs> oh, monsieur. <laughs> Obviously, there's a stranger to New Orleans. <laughs> That's right. I'm just in from the bayou. Jim Bowie is my name. Ah, and mine, John James Audubon, monsieur. Well, I'm glad to know you, Mr. Audubon. Maybe you would allow me to buy you a drink. Ah, uh, I am not a drinking man, monsieur Bowie. I am a Quaker. But there is a coffee house around the corner. Well, then, by all means. Uh, you say Mademoiselle de Bornay is the reason you have no place to stay? Yes. She will not permit me to finish her portrait, and so I cannot be paid, and so I starve. No, it is all hopeless. Seems to me you give up mighty easy, Mr. Audubon. A better artist than a businessman, I suppose, huh? Uh, and we are a good businessman, monsieur? Well, I hope to be. My brothers and I own some land in a sawmill up at Bayou Sara. I'm in New Orleans to sell lumber. But uh, tell me more about Mademoiselle de Bonnet. Oh, that you de de Bonnet. She is so proud and so spoiled. And so beautiful. Uh -huh, but she is a de Bonnet. And they care only for their pleasure. Now, her brother, Narcisse, he cares for nothing but drinking and gambling at Saint Sylvain. Saint Sylvain? Uh, where is that? It matters not. It is for the rich. <laughs> for us of smaller purse, here is the coffee out. After you, monsieur? No, wait. I got a better idea. Let's go to my hotel. We'll have dinner sent up to my room. Dinner? Well, of course, if you're not hungry. Oh, no, no. I accept, monsieur. Merci, by all means. Good. And after that, we'll spend the evening at uh, saint Savan. Oh, believe me, Monsieur Bowie, this is no place for us. We are not welcome here. Why not? <laughs> but one thing, uh, your clothes. Why, my mother cut and sewed this outfit special for my trip to New Orleans. Well, well, the Quaker paint jobber. Now, that is not Sister Bowman. The girl's brother? Yes. And drunk again. The Quaker paint dauber who considers birds more important than my sister. Oh, please, please, monsieur. I apologize most abjectly. 
Exactly. It, 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 it was a misunderstanding. Misunderstanding? That you keep her waiting three weeks before the second sitting of the portrait? But I, I was up in the bayou looking for Aaron. And there were be Aaron? Aaron? While my sister waits? He apologized. You might have the courtesy to hear him out. And who are you to speak to me of courtesy? Some clodhopper from upriver? It's no affair of yours. Anything affecting Mr. Audubon is my affair. Oh, no, oh no. I see. Uh, your name, sir? Jim Bowie. Very well, Mr. Bowie. My friend shall call upon you. Monsieur? Oh, they must leave town at once. Why? What's happened? Well, thou hast been challenged to a duel. You mean because of a few words with a drunk? Yes, it is the code. It, we must leave town. I'm here to sell my timber, and I'm staying till I do it. Excuse me. Yes? I am Philippe Cabanal, and this gentleman, Henri Contrecourt. Your servant. Monsieur de Bonnet has empowered us to arrange terms of the duel according to your satisfaction. My satisfaction? Since huh? you are the challenged party, yes. Will you please name your seconds and inform us of the time and place and choice of weapons? Tell Monsieur de Bournay I shall give him my reply as soon as possible. By uh, noon tomorrow. Thank you. By noon tomorrow. Good morning, Judelon. Not he. I thought you were still asleep. My dear sister, I may come home late, but I never sleep till the noon hour. Also, today, I'm expecting some callers. The second for Monsieur Bowie. Well, then you've heard. Naturally. Philip Cabanaugh brought you home last night. He told me. That there was to be a duel or that he loved you? <laughs> Both. Uh -huh. They seem to go together with such monotonous regularity. Would you please tell Mr. DeBornay that James Bowie is calling? Narcisse, he's, he's here. Monsieur Bowie? Oh, good morning, sir. I was expecting to see your second... Well, I'm not used to dealing through others on personal matters. Then if you will state the time and the weapons. The time when next it snows in New Orleans and what? the weapon snowballs. <laughs> How delightful. Now, please, present Monsieur Bowie to me. Very well, my dear. Monsieur James Bowie, my sister, Mademoiselle Judela Daphne Seraphine de Bournay. A great, great pleasure, Mademoiselle. Thank you. And let us hope that yes. our New Orleans winters stay warm and balmy. As you can see, Monsieur Bouet, my sister takes my affairs lightly, perhaps because, being a brother, I cannot be a suitor. <laughs> <laughs> I hope, Monsieur Bouet, that you speak of your own sisters with more gallantry. I have no sisters. Oh, then brothers? Uh, two. And your parents? Well, my father is dead. My mother lives with us at Bayou Sara. Uh, Monsieur, please end my sister's suspense. Are you or are you not married? Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> really? Monsieur Bowie, we hold a ball at this house next Thursday a week. Will you not come as our guest? Well, uh... Of course you will. On one condition. Yes? That you forgive my friend Mr. Audubon and allow him to finish your portrait. Hmm. Perhaps. Perhaps? He means yes, monsieur. Now I'm off to my tailor's, and I think you'd better meet him, too. Well, for what reason? Well, you accepted Judelon's invitation to the ball, didn't you? Well, yes, but what is... Well, surely you don't intend to dance with my sister in this suit. Well, I'll have to. I came to New Orleans with only $164 <laughs> in my pocket. For... A gentleman does not pay his tailor, my friend. No, we shall outfit you from head to toe. Monsieur Coquelin will put it on my bill. Oh, but don't but I forget, could... my sister admires handsome men in handsome clothes. You know, all of a sudden I'm convinced. <laughs> Still not dancing. I asked her twice and been turned down twice. And <laughs> try another girl. No, that's not why I came here tonight. The Virginia Real, Henri? Oh, but that's not until after the intermission. I know, but promise me that honor. You have bet someone that you will dance it with me. A man does not gamble with his life, and that's what you are to me. Don't look so sad. Then give me the Virginia here. I'll think about it, Philip. <laughs> oh, 
about you, too, Monsieur Audubon. Even I, mademoiselle, and I am not a dancing man. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the Virginia Reel. Gurdala, oh. you must no, 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 it must be with you. No, with me. No, 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 none of you. Now, excuse me. Monsieur Bowie, may I have your arm? We scandalize them completely. You know, a girl is never, never supposed to walk out onto a balcony alone with a man. I hope you realize the compliment, Jim. Jim, are you listening? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. I was thinking about Bayou Sarah. Bayou Sarah? Judlan, have you ever been to the Bayou country? No. They tell me it's the wilderness. It is. Millions and millions of acres where nobody except the Indians and a few hunters ever set foot. But it can be changed. It can be just like the land around New Orleans here, rich with cotton and rice. I want to make it like that. And Judelon, I want you to help me. You want me to leave New Orleans? I want you to be my wife. Jim, I... I know this is sudden. We've known each other only a few days. And yet I think the first time we met... Oh, yes, we both felt the same thing for each other. We knew that, but... But, Jim, to live in a cabin in the wilderness. It won't always be a wilderness. A log cat. No parties, no friends, no fun. Only hard work. <laughs> well, I think it's time we went inside. Judelon, listen to me. Don't let the life you've lived here spoil the whole future. I have no fears for my future, thank you. I'm not a bio woman to be grabbed and carried off at the first kiss. If you want a straw for your tent, Mr. Bowie, go back to your country wenches. I see. Good night, mademoiselle. Good alarm. Oh, Henri. What did he do? Monsieur Bowie. Oh, let's not talk about him. Good alarm. I want to know. Please, Henri. With my fault, really. I should never have invited him here. Then he did insult you. I didn't say that. You don't have to. Please excuse me. Henri. Ari, no. Nazis. Nazis. Yes, what's wrong? Oh, go after them, Nazis, before it's too late. Red, this is again, Monsieur Bowie. An amazing run of luck. How much have I got? Nearly 50,000, Monsieur. Jim. Jim. Well, the party over so early, Nazis. Jim. You don't answer only what happened. You've got to leave here right now. When I'm winning? Oh, no. Your sister wants to marry a rich New Orleans gentleman, and I intend to be one before the night is over. Face your best gentleman. On the red, please. How much, monsieur? Everything. The play begins. You do well, monsieur Bouet. Henri. But a pig with money is still a pig. Henri, stop it. Black, monsieur. The housemate. And now the pig is perilous. Were you speaking to me? Jim, Henri, listen to Stay me. Stay out of my claws, Nazis. No. I have just made it mine. Then, sir, then. Do you wish me? Yes. The city Bonnet and I require the use of your garden and two rapiers. Are you ready, gentlemen? Ready? Ready. Then, allez, monsieur. Well... Monsieur saint -Sauvain, I think you'd better send word to Mademoiselle de Mornay. Tell her that, that her brother died instantly. It shall be done. And now, Monsieur Contracour, you were about to challenge me. Consider it done. What is your choice of weapons? Knives. Knives? I refuse to disgrace the code by using such a weapon. And keep your sword. I'll still use a knife. If Monsieur saint can supply one. A knife? 
Yeah, somewhere, perhaps. Ah, uh, yes. In my collection of guns and swords, there is a Spanish cuchillo, a short knife. Good. And we want a room, empty and dark. Dark? Monsieur, men cannot duel in the dark. Maybe not, but they can fight. <laughs> Attic, monsieur, completely empty and dark as safe and fast. Thank you. But, but surely you will not ask me to go in there with you? No, wait here in the hall. Choose your corner. I can't see one. We meet in the center? We'll meet when we meet. You ready? Ready. Very good ears. believe in that wilderness that you despise. I'm going to make something of that land. I'm going to make something of myself. And then I'm coming back for you. Wish me luck, you long. I wish us both luck, Jim. We may need it. Act two of the Iron Mistress in a moment. Make a friend and you make an ally. There's a thought for you to keep in mind, as many another American has. Take the famous all-Negro basketball team, the Harlem Globetrotters. As unofficial ambassadors, in one year they played ball before more than a million people on four continents. In Rio de Janeiro, they entertained crowds of from 30,000 to 50,000. During one summer, they toured Europe and Africa, chalking up another 600,000 fans. In 1952, they celebrated their 25th anniversary as a team by circling the globe. Yes, sir, the team organized by Abe Saperstein really gets around. And their exhibitions have been more than just a demonstration of American basketball. They've been a lot more. The team is a living example of American fair play and sportsmanship in and out of uniform. Abe Saperstein now carries a letter which reads in part, The Harlem Globetrotters have proved themselves ambassadors of goodwill. On any future tours, please call on us for any help we can give. And the letter is signed by the United States State Department. In being ambassadors of fair play, the Harlem Globetrotters prove that by helping others, you help your country. Now our producer, Mr. Cummings. Act two of The Iron Mistress, starring Virginia Mayo as Judelon, and John Lund as Jim Bowie. Two years passed, and now it is 1827. Much has happened and much has changed, but not the beautiful and vain Chiarulan de Bonnet. In the music room of her home, she sits for still another portrait by the painter John James Audubon. Monsieur Audubon, the other day you asked about Mr. Bowie. Oh? That glass is there something? Indirectly. Perhaps you remember Philip Cavanaugh. Of course, the friend of my poor brother. Monsieur Cavanaugh is on a business trip to Notches. I have his letter here. It seems that Mr. Bowie has bought thousands of acres of bottomland around Bayou Serra, cleared them and planted them to cotton. He's even made Bayou Serra a freight stop for the steamboat. He has done all this? Oh, Monsieur Bowie? Oh, Monsieur Bowie. This is the newspaper clipping that Monsieur Cavanaugh sent me. Oh. James Bowie promises to ship 15,000 bales this year. Newcomer declares Bayou Sarah soon to rival Natchez as cotton. 
No, gentlemen. As president of the Bank of Natchez, I cannot extend you any more credit. That's your final word, Judge Crane? I'm sorry, gentlemen. I hope you understand. Yes, thoroughly. You want our lands at by yourself. The bank asks only what's lawfully due. The payment of the note. We said we're prepared to pay it with land. Yes, but the bank's new policy is to require cash. $25,000 by the first of the month. All right. Come on, General. We're just wasting our time here. I must have been insane to have gone into this thing with you, boy. Three weeks from today, I'll be bankrupt. Better to have lost it at the gambling table. You mean that? Yes. At least I'd have been ruined at a gentleman's sport. Well, then maybe it's not too late. I think I can give you that chance. How so? Just come along with me. Unless you're too much of a gentleman to visit the lowest dive in Nashville. Sturdivant, please. Mm hmm. Bloody Jack Sturdivant. <laughs> Drinks for Mr. Boy and the General Harry, the best in the house. And now, gentlemen, is Steel Duke here? Got him right out there. Who on earth is Steel Duke? A racehorse. Just in from Nashville. Leads some mighty fine steak horses up there. Can you show him to the General? Right now. Just follow me. Jim, what's a racehorse got to do with us? I'm buying him for $700. You? This way, gentlemen. Oh. Now, I know you're crazy. Our back's into the wall, and you buy a racehorse. Mm hmm. The horse that's going to beat Kerry Isle. Judge Crane's horse? <laughs> Kerry Isle's the fastest horse in Natchez. And Steel Duke is the fastest horse west of Kentucky. Take a good look at him, General. Hmm. He has fine points. Yes, sir. Mighty fine points. But there has to be something wrong, or Sturdivant here wouldn't be selling. You ought to be able to figure that out, General. The rules of the Duncan Cup say that horses got to be entered by gentlemen. And the high and mighty round here claim I don't qualify to that. My loss, your game. General, the running of the Duncan Cup is two weeks off. Just in time for us. Judge Crane and his friends are so sure of Cary Isle, they'll give us odds of five to one. All we put up is 5000 to win 25000 Only 5000 You know that's every penny of ready cash that you and I have. Well, General? Well, you said you'd rather be ruined at a gentleman's sport. <clears throat> Mr. Turnaround, write out a bill of sale. <laughs> congratulate you on the victory of Steel Duke. Judelon. Oh, how wonderful to see you. I wish we'd known your horse was so fast. My husband bet heavily on Kerry Isle. Your husband? Yes. I was going to write to you, Jim. I married Philip Cavanaugh. Well, I suppose you couldn't wait for me forever. Jim! Jim, will you come over here? Just a minute, General. Jim... I want you to understand. Philip was my mother's choice. We do things like that in New Orleans. And besides, well, I thought I wanted a man like Philip. Whose name could match yours? The social position? Yes. But I know now I was wrong. You mean you don't love him? No. Then I'm sorry for both of you. I crave your pardon, ma'am, but Judge Crane and I must speak to Mr. Bowie. Yes, at once. Oh, well, we'll see each other later, Jim. All right. Well, gentlemen? Mr. Bowie, before my friends and I pay off our wages on this race, we want proof that you really own Steel U. I've got the papers right here, sir. There you are, Judge. I told you. Just a minute. This states that Jack Sturdivant won the horse in a card game from one Joseph Levington of Nashville, but I don't know, Mr. Levington. Can you swear that this is his signature? Are you insinuating I forged it? No, not you, sir. But we all know the reputation of Sturdivant. Jim, uh, I've already talked with the race officials. They're willing to give us time to find Mr. Levington and verify his signature. And if we can't? Steel Duke will be disqualified if my horse declares the winner. Good day, gentlemen. Jim, we're in for it. I'm not worried. Well, you'd better be. Crane and his crowd are bad losers. They won't stop at anything to avoid paying up. 
I'm well able to take care of myself, General. And now, I'm off to Nashville. I'm not ashamed to admit it, Mr. Bowie. Some of the finest swords and knives hereabouts have been hammered out on this anvil. Yes, so I understand, Mr. Black. Maybe you could make me a knife the exact shape and size of this model here. Huh? Are you whittled out this model yourself? Yes. Uh-huh. Ah, the back of the blade seems mighty thick. Though. That's to give it strength. Above all, it must not snap. I've seen swords fail, knives fail. I want something that'll never fail. <laughs> That's a challenge, sir. And I like challenges. Come, I'll show you something. Yeah. You ever see anything like this before? I know. About a rock. I saw a fireball once. It crossed the sky bright as the sun. Then there was a roar like a hundred cannons. The death of a shooting star. And this is a fragment I found. Steel. Pure steel from another world. Tougher and harder than anything on this earth. And someday, sir, the forge and anvil of James Black are going to match it. Then let it be in my knife. I'll be back from Nashville in four days. Four days? <laughs> Sir, you're not asking for a knife. You're asking for a miracle. Well, is that too much? When my life may depend on it? And then four days, Mr. Boy. Sam, clean off the furnace. Don't leave a cinder big enough to make your eye water. We're going to make some steel. Even better than I hoped for. And I can never be again. I fused into that steel a fragment of a star. Yes, for better or worse, Mr. Boy, that knife of yours has a bit of heaven in it. Or a bit of hell. Fourteen thousand seven hundred, eight hundred, nine hundred, fifteen thousand. <laughs> oh. Give that visit of yours to Nashville, it's sure paying off handsomely. What about the 10000 from Judge Crane? He's promised to have it here in my office by noon. And I'm here exactly on time, gentlemen. Well, very glad to see you, Judge. I'm sure you are. Uh, Jim, would you write out a receipt for the judge? I see he has the money in his hand. That's $10,000, isn't it? 10000 which you won't have long to enjoy, General. <laughs> judge Crane. So you want blood for your money, eh? Very well. Jim, would you be one of my seconds? With pleasure, Judge Crane, if you'll name your own seconds so I can arrange the details with them. In the hour, sir. I presume it'll be pistols. Yes. Tomorrow morning at the Dahlia Sandbar. Judge Crane, are you ready? Ready. General Cooney, are you ready? Ready. I don't like the looks of this, General. Crane's brought half of his friends along as witnesses. Well, we've got a few on our side, too, my boy. The seconds, please stand away. One, two, three. <laughs> Neither participants having been wounded, I ask the gentlemen to consider their honor satisfied and to shake hands. No! Again, again! General Cooney! Again, sir. Very well. One, two, three! <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen, not even the most strict interpretation of the code requires you fire a third shot. Maybe. Oh, but you won, Jim. That's the important thing. Mm, maybe. Well, I suppose now you and Philippe will be going back to New Orleans. Philip can't. Why not? Hard losses. He's so in debt to Jack Sturdivant that Sturdivant is making him cheat other gamblers. Well, he could just walk out, can he? No. Philip is in terror of Sturdivant. You know how deadly he is with a knife. I've heard, yes. Well, maybe I can do something about it. Oh, first you've got to get well, Jim. Really. Mm-hmm. Good and well. Because I've got a lot of things to do. A whole new life to build. A new life? 
I've done a lot of thinking here in this bed, Jude Long. Ever since I first went to New Orleans to sell that lumber, I've known nothing but jewels and fighting for money and power. I want something better than that. So, I'm heading for Texas. Texas? Yes. Jim, could I go with you? What? Oh, I can't go on with Philip any longer. You know it's always been you. Huh. What does that mean? You don't love me anymore? I've always loved you. You're the reason for everything I've done since the day I met you. Then take me with you. You're married. You're Philippe's wife. That's why I'm going to Texas. Jim, you'll never be able to get away from me. Not in Texas. Not anywhere. In a moment, Act Three of The Iron Mistress. Corporal Sam Adler of the 2nd Armored Division had an idea that he could put his talent to work for the betterment of German-American relations. His background included two college degrees in music, and he knew that there were many musicians in the Army. So he organized the 7th Army Symphony Orchestra. It was a spare time project that soon gained official notice, and the group made a total of 44 appearances in 43 days. New and difficult scores were learned almost overnight, and German and American music was played at each concert. Everywhere the orchestra traveled, the audiences greeted it with amazement and wild applause. Here was a group, a cross-section of America, representing all races and creeds that brought together thousands of people on a common cultural and spiritual plane. There's no doubt that through the medium of music, Corporal Sam Adler made a substantial contribution to the improvement of German-American relations. Such acts as these by you and your friends today are shaping our world of tomorrow. We pause now for station identification. rises on Act Three of The Iron Mistress, starring Virginia Mayo as Shudelon and John Lund as Jim Bowie. As soon as Jim Bowie recovered from his wounds, he paid a visit to Sturtevant's gambling den. Yes, Philip Cavanaugh was there, dealing the cards under the watchful eye of bloody Jack Sturtevant himself. Well, boy, what brings you here? They tell me you're a pretty good knife fighter. I never met a better one. You're looking at him. I, uh, I heard you never pick a fight. I'm picking one right now. <laughs> All right, boy. You got the guts for a ten-foot circle, our wrists strapped together? What do you think? Boys, bring us some rope. Tie our wrists together. Get it over with. It is over. You won't be dealing any more cards with that hand or needing the services of Mr. Kavanaugh. Cut us loose. Out, get out. Both of you. Come on, Kavanaugh. I'm not through yet, boy. The next time we meet, you're going to be dead. You mean if we meet. I'm leaving for Texas in the morning. I suppose I ought to thank you, boy, but I know you didn't do this for me. That's right. The boat for New Orleans leaves Natchez at 10 o'clock tonight. I want you on it. I'll be there to see that you are. And after that? By this time tomorrow, I'll be riding the Spanish trail to Texas. Alone? Yes, Philippe. Alone. A 
Oh, Stewart. Well, yes, sir. Maybe you know if a Mr. Philippe Cabanal came aboard. Cabanal? Oh, yes. Yes, sir. Just took the baggage to their stateroom. Their stateroom? Yes, sir. I'm going back with Philippe. When did you decide that? Jim, you have so much courage. I have none. Neither has Philip. Perhaps that's why we belong together. I'm afraid to let go of the only life I've known. I see. Oh, don't hate me, Jim. I could never do that. Then goodbye. And good luck and take. Yes. Goodbye, dear love. I have none. I'm afraid to let go of the only life I've known. Oh, don't hate me, Jim. Don't hate me. Could never do that. Never. 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 Never do what, son? Huh? Who are you? Where am I? Where? Well, a couple of ways of answering that. You're in the state of Louisiana. And you've been in a state of coma. <laughs> Are you a, a doctor? Yeah, I'm a doctor, all right, but mostly for horses. My knife? Where is it? Knife? Well, maybe still buried in one of them three dead men you left in the road. Oh. There should have been four. The Sturdivant got away. How did I get here? Oh, you were brought in style. Come in a big fancy coach and four with... Servants riding up top on the box, and the beautiful lady inside holding your head in her lap. Said she found you sprawled out in the road. Well, who was she? Didn't she tell you? Yeah, I got her name written down here on the card. Mm hmm. Senorita D. Veramendi, daughter of His Excellency, the Vice Governor of Texas. Said she was on her way home to San Antonio. Left me some real Spanish doubloons, too, for your keep or for your burying. Senorita de Vermendi, daughter of the vice governor. Yep, real Mexican beauty. Oh, and she left this little gold cross for you, too. Doctor, how long will I be laid up? Oh, three or four weeks, I'd say. Why, you got some pleasant business? Yes, in San Antonio. <laughs> Uh, yes, Your Excellency. I don't speak Spanish. I but... speak English. I am informed you wish to see my daughter. Yes, I want to thank her for saving my life and to return the money she left with my doctor. Ah, then you are the Americano, the wounded gladiator with the face of a noble Roman. Father. <laughs> Forgive me, Kerida. I did not mean to embarrass you, but that is the way you described him. May I present Senor Bui, my daughter... Senorita Ursula de Veramendi. Your servant, Senorita. I apologize for presenting myself to you with the dust of the road still on my clothes, but I've been so anxious to thank you and to repay oh, you. please, Senor. I'm amply repaid to see you here, alive and well. If you wish, Senor, you may give my daughter's money to the church, to the Madonna de San Antonio de Decar. I shall do so, Your Excellency. Meanwhile, I shall have the servants show you to your room. Oh, but... I can't stay here. Oh, senor, this is the governor's house. To prefer any other would be most impolite. Really? Yes, senor. Extremely impolite. Well, then, I'll be polite. Then you enjoy our fandango, senor. Oh, very much. I only wish I could dance it better but you are learning most rapidly. Hmm. Can you say the same about my guitar playing? 
no. I think I must give you many more lessons. You know, that's just what I was hoping. Please sit down, Senor Bowie. Thank you. If perhaps you wonder why I asked to see you alone this evening. Well, I guess you want to know how much longer I'll impose on your hospitality. It is not that. I do not speak as your host, but as the governor. You are a famous man, senor. Even here in Texas, we have heard of your doings, your magnificent courage. But I ask myself, why does senor Bowie stay on in San Antonio? Is it perhaps to escape some punishment by the American law? No, Your Excellency. The real reason is waiting for me right outside in the patio. Then you force me to speak not as a host or the governor, but as a father. I like and admire you, senor, but I cannot forget the violence stretching behind you. Good heavens, man. You've been wedded to a knife. Men have called it your iron mistress. Your Excellency, the knife is gone. Another man has it now. Then, no more do it. You have my hand on it, sir. You have mine also. And my blessing. Thank you. Ursula. You have spoken with my father? Yes, I'll be leaving in the morning. Oh. But only to settle my affairs back in Natchez. Ursula, would you be my wife? Are you truly sure you want to marry me? Well, what makes you doubt it? For that day when I found you so cruelly wounded, I heard you speak a name. I did not know if it was a man's name or a woman's name. Now I know it was a woman's. She is still in your heart. No, Ursula. I don't think so. I hope you will still be able to say that when you are back in Natchez. Yes, sir, Mr. Bowie. That is your stateroom at the end of the corridor. I just put your bags inside. Sir. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Oh, here you are. Oh, thank you, Mr. Bowie. Mm-hmm. Jim, I thought I saw you come aboard. Tootalot. Yes. I'm on my way down to Bayou Sara to wind up my business. And, uh, how is Philippe? No different. You saved him from Jack Sturdivant, but he always finds someone else. But let's talk about Jim Bowie. How is Texas? Better even than I expected. Let's go. Let me Let's go. go, Mr. Kavanaugh. Philip. I think I'm drunk, don't you? Mm. Well, I am. And I'm going to get even drunker. I lost the money. They took it all. Every dollar. Jim, help me get him into our cabin. Mm, of course. So, it's you, boy. Might know you'd find you alone. Looks like it was a good thing. I'd hope maybe you'd given up gambling, Cabanal. He's been playing with the river gamblers ever since we came aboard. Some friends sent Philip to St. Louis to sell their cotton. We left there with $50,000, and it wasn't our money. You hear me, Philippe? It wasn't ours. <laughs> That's what I told them. And you know something. They didn't care. <laughs> Where are they right now? In the lounge, I suppose. All right. I'll be back. I'll tell the steward to send in some coffee. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I can always count on you, Jim. Have I ever been able to say that about you? Philip Cavanaugh. You've made the name a disgrace for me to bear. I have. Who wanted me to gamble with somebody else's money? Whose debt have I been paying off? That's why you married me, to pay your debt. No, I haven't anything left. Not even my pride. That's right. Get out your pistol. But don't tell me you're going to kill yourself again. You bore me. You don't know. Oh, it's no good, Philippe. I'm through. I'm leaving you. You don't know. Go to bed. Jim Bowie. He's the cause of everything. It's always been Jim Bowie. <laughs> Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Sturdivant. I'm 
understand Jim Boo is aboard, which is his cabin. The next one on your right. Oh, thanks. But he's not in, Mr. Sturdivant. I just saw him in the lounge. That's all right. I'll just step inside and wait for him. Uh, but, but don't you tell him. We're old friends, you see, and I want to sort of surprise him. Well, I, I reckon so. Of course it is. <laughs> Jim, I'm very grateful that you were able to get the money back. But I'm sure Philip is in a drunken stupor by now. You can give it to him in the morning. Mm -mm. I don't want to be carrying around $50,000 of somebody else's money. Well, the gamblers will just take it away from Philip again. No, not this bunch. I turned them over to the captain. Jim, wait. What's wrong? There at the end of the corridor is Philip with a gun. He's going into one of the cabins. Hey, that's my cabin. Yes, they're both dead, all right. I ought to have known Mr. Sturdivant was up to something. He was just waiting here with that knife to kill you, Mr. Booty. Instead, he gets poor Mr. Cavanaugh. Yes. I'd better find the captain. Let me through, please. Jim. I'm terribly sorry, Judalon. I figured that Sturdivant still had my knife, but I never expected to see it buried in Philippe. Jim, the boat's coming in at Kingston. We can get off there. We? Sounds strange, doesn't it? We. It's the way it should always have been. Philippe just died, and you can walk off? Yes, I'm free at last, Jim. It's just the two of us now. We can go anywhere, do all the things I wanted to do, and... Get along. Listen to me. I thought I came back here to sell out. But in the back of my head, it was hoping to find you. You've been the reason behind everything. Philippe was willing to kill for you, to die for you, like all the others. Jim. Yes, your own brother, Narcisse, Contracour, General Cuny, Judge Crane, even Sturdivant and his men. One way or another, they died because I was in love with you. But now, there has to be an end. But, Jim, if you love me... No, Judalon. No longer. No woman is worth the lives of eight men. You do not have to tell me what happened, querido mio. I can read it in your eyes. You're at last free of the past. Yes, Ursula. Completely free. And happier than I've been in so many years. Good. Then, no more doing? No more. The knife of Jim Bowie belongs to others now. And the heart of Jim Bowie? That, too, is free of the past, Ursula. And you want to stay here in Texas? Most of all, I want you to marry me. Now I am... Truly sure. Will you be my wife, Ursula? Oh, yes, Jim. Yes. In a moment, our stars will return. Our servicemen in Europe have a wonderful opportunity to observe new customs and traditions. And they're finding out that these ideas of other people aren't so strange after all. For instance, in almost every country, France, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, Austria, they have traditional dances for welcoming spring. Bright costumes are worn, and the village dancers parade through the streets to a central point where spring is officially made welcome and winter is buried in the past. Well, all this might sound strange, but as our servicemen have observed, it's nothing more than a European version of our own Easter parade. The bright costumes and the new bonnets are seen from New York's Fifth Avenue to San Francisco's Market Street. Hundreds of schools and colleges hold their annual spring festivals of music and dancing. And in many New England communities, the Maypole is still circled as a welcome to spring. This community of interests among various countries is an important part of mutual understanding. True enough, the way of doing things may be different, but the ideals are the same. These customs and traditions are important to the people who follow them. And our servicemen are helping to maintain goodwill 
by observing the customs of other people in other lands. Now, here's Mr. Cummings with our stars. And they're coming forward for a bow. Virginia Mayo and John Ladden. How about the radio theater play for next week? Another of our 20 greats, John. And this one has a bit of everything. Music, laughter, and drama. A wonderful show for the entire family. Mother wore tights. And with one of the most delightful teams we've ever presented on this stage. Dan Daly and Mitzi Gaynor singing the song hits from this nostalgic 20th Century Fox picture. That is a favorite, Irving. Good night. Good night. Part of our cast tonight were Jean Bates as Ursula, Chef Mencken as Philippe, Whitfield Connor as Narcisse, Jay Novello as Crane, Ted DeCorsh as Jack, Ellen Reed as General Cuny, Herb Butterfield as Don Juan, and William Conrad, Lawrence Dobkin, Edgar Barrier, Ralph Moody, Carlton Young, and Eddie Marr. Radio Theater is produced by Irving Cummings. Our orchestra is directed by Rudy Schrager. This is your announcer, Ken Carpenter, inviting you to be with us again next week at this same time for another presentation of the Hollywood Radio Theater. Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.